as a good consultant, I have to have the clicker and the PowerPoint presentation, but I won't, I won't hit that yet. Um, thanks for uh, the kind introduction, Michael. Kurt, I've known you for a long time. Thanks for uh, inviting me, and uh, it's great what you're doing here with Lake Forest, and it's very exciting. So uh, a couple quick uh, stories before I dive in. So first of all, that cover. So um, anybody who's ever written a book, and I, I could look at these three in particular, it's uh, going through like what your cover is going to be like a pretty grueling process. And we had all these kind of really creative and, and, and kind of the, the whole process of the shift and what does that mean and how do you show that. And so we landed on this, this color template and this idea of the shift. And for about three months, we were ready to go. We're going to market, we're going to press. And then just a week before it was actually going to press, some junior person within my company, it's called Profit, noticed that the slope was going down instead of up and, and we were one week away from shifting down and, and maybe having a very different conversation tonight. And then um, my, my second story is, um, I, so again, these guys know this, when you write a book, you have to do a lot of media and, a lot, and, it's, and it sounds sexy, but like I was in a Turkish newspaper this weekend and a buddy in Tokyo saw me on a Bloomberg thing, like nobody really sees any of this or reads any of this, but you do it, you, you get your name out there. And I was... Um, interviewed on, is anybody from the Phoenix, Scottsdale area? So there's a, there's a station called uh, KNN, or KNN AM, and it's a, a business talk show thing. And, and so they said, um, Scott, call in. Your segment's going to be at 725, and there's going to be three commercials playing before your segment. So get on the phone. you, you got to do it on the landline. Get on your phone. Listen for the first commercial, the second commercial, and then cue yourself on the third commercial, right? So I heard the first commercial. And it's, it's interesting because you're hearing, you know, Phoenix commercials, which you don't hear in Chicago. And so the first commercial is this, the second commercial. The third commercial is about rat control in your attics. And I had no idea that rats in attics was an issue in Phoenix, but I, you know, I went along with the rest of the uh, commercial. And the very end is Stop Rats Now. And Scott Davis, author of The Shift, and it was the most interesting transition I've ever had. In, in, um... So one of the things that you do in these interviews is, is you get asked a lot of questions about, like, why did you write your book? And you think, well, I've got to think about that for a second. But uh, for me, um, I'm a marketing guy. 25 years in marketing, started off at P&G, been doing it my whole life. Um, believe most companies haven't even come close to kind of reaching their marketing potential. But uh, there's three reasons why I wrote the book. First reason is, uh, and this one's somewhat comical, somewhat not. A few years back, I was going through my first two books, and they were both more uh, brand-oriented. And I was trying to grab a couple quotes for a presentation I had to do. And I figured, why not steal from myself? So I opened the books, and I looked for a good quote. And as I went through all of the quotes and all the cases in my book, or both my books, nobody was still with their company anymore. And these were my, fr these were my clients. These are people I had worked with for years. And, and there had been a total turnover of these marketing leaders in these companies. Okay, so now I'm, I'm, I'm like thinking to myself, what's, what's going on? And then I think back to P&G about 25 years ago. Not one person still at P&G that I worked with in marketing and brand management. Then I go back to Kellogg, um, not to give you my whole, I'll stop in a second. I'm not going to give you my whole life. But going back to Kellogg, we just had our 20-year reunion, and one person is still with their same marketing job that they got 20 years ago, and that's at J&J. &J. And, then, and then I started looking at my clients and the amount of churn in marketing was just, was just remarkable. And there's this, this um, whoops, excuse me. First of all, if you're going to ever present, don't have the name profit next to your name anywhere on the screen because it just <laughs> sets up things you can't. But there's this study, right? There's this, this crazy study. Sorry the O dropped off, but maybe that's appropriate. Um, there's this crazy study that kind of started, because I was getting, I was thinking, okay, it's my clients, it's people that featured in my books, it's my P&G friends, it's my Kellogg friends. I'm thinking it's a, me. Maybe I'm the problem. And then, um, and then, that was a joke. But then I, looked, then I went to the Spencer Stewart study that comes out every year, and it's a ridiculous statistic that marketers have about a two and a half year shelf life at best. And you look at CEOs, that all dropped off too, CFOs, and they're all in the five to seven year lifespan, you know, at a minimum. And so I, I, I started getting really frustrated because the marketing, again, has so much to offer. And, it, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. So that was my first reason why. Second is, I continue to be in conversations with CEOs, CFOs, COOs that don't get marketing. They look at marketing as marketing communications. They look at marketing as advertising. They look at marketing as discretionary spend. They look at marketing, you know, they put them at the kids' table when everybody else is at the adult table. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not in the strategy conversation. 
They haven't built relationships across the C-suite because it's a rotating door. So I'm thinking about my first reason is marketers are leaving their jobs really frequently. Second, they get no respect. They're being marginalized. So, those, so now I'm, I'm frustrated and mad. And, and so the third reason, though, and this gets back to some of the comments that Adam just made, I saw this tremendous opportunity. And, and, and I, actually, opportunity meeting necessity. Because I continue to see companies looking at organic growth as their mantra, getting more from their investments and their assets, doing more with less. And I'm thinking to myself, marketing is probably one of the most untapped, under-leveraged assets within any organization that very few people know how to exploit. And so then I went to a few of my friends. And I'm not name dropping here, but these are actually really like business friends. And I, and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for clarity. I, I, because marketers are just, we're not at the table. And we're not in strategy. And, we're, and we're, we're getting dismissed. And we're getting asked for nickels we don't have. And so I started to reach out and do all these interviews. And I tried to figure out how to separate the best from the rest. And what I call visionary marketers versus more tacticianer marketers. Visionary marketers, they think with a P&L orientation. They think about the growth strategy. They think three to five years out, exactly the same point. They're not building their marketing plan on what they did this year, but they're building it in service of the five-year plan. They're building relationships across the organization. Most marketers, I don't know if, any, if anybody's in marketing here. Is there anybody in marketing, actually? Kurt, thanks. <laughs> but, my, but most marketers most marketers operate in a kind of what I call vertical. Apparently, I won't be for very long. No, 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 no. I think you've already passed the trend. You, you, you crossed over. You jumped the shark. Um, but most, most marketers operate in what I call a, a vertical kind of functional silo, and they don't reach across the organization. And I look at somebody like Steven, who has basically taken a brand and a business that had the worst reputation of any company five years ago, um, was not a very friendly company, was basically, from my perspective, a real estate company that happened to sell a lot of stuff, and it was pretty awful to any of its suppliers, and turned it into a brand that actually, none of us are the target, um, I, I, I know that, but turned into a brand that's actually being embraced. And you could say, yeah, Walmart was built for an economy like this, but it was not built to be a brand that's going to endure beyond this economy. And Stephen brought this marketing discipline. And the coolest quote he gave me was, he walked in the door. He was the first CMO ever at Walmart, which is interesting in itself. He came from Frito-Lay. And the board interviewed him. The board said that it wasn't the CEO, um, Lee Scott. It was the board that said, we need to get some marketing muscle, because Target is starting to get really interesting. And this is, again, five, six years ago. And the board interviewed him. And Lee Scott's point, the CEO, is why do we need marketing? 250 million people shop at Walmart every year. And, and the board said, and Stephen said to the board, I'm going to prove that, that 200, just because 250 million people shop doesn't mean we have 250 million Walmart shoppers. And he spent his first year, and he told me about this, he'd spend his day job doing the Sunday circular and doing all the things that you have to do in your day-to-day -day job as a tacticianer. And he spent his nights and weekends doing this massive quantitative segmentation that gave him insights of how to focus on the segments that kind of drive disproportionate margin. It's a visionary marketer. Thinks Wade, CEO, partner in crime. Mendenhall, you know, Mark Hurd, the Steve Jobs part, I agree. Mark Hurd was named um, most, uh, HP, most admired company. You guys remember six years ago, HP was in the toilet. I mean, Compaq, it was a, a Carly and lover or hater. She was very polarizing. And that company was in trouble. And Michael on the marketing side, Mark on the strategic side, came together and have really kind of reshaped it. And then Joel um, really took a what was known as a, a cheap brand and a low-priced kind of, and turned it into kind of a universal brand. And something, again, built for these times. So I looked at these guys. And I interviewed 50 or 60 of these, what I'd call visionary marketers. And then, I, um, then I, I asked a buddy of mine at um, Hydric and Struggles, because I'm, I'm still mad. There's 90% you know, turnover in the marketing field. Is still, it still should upset you. I said, give me another side of the story that I don't have. And so this year, 2009, he gave me 75 US-based promotions out of marketing into either CEO, COO, or BU lead role. So he kind of dispelled this idea that every marketer is just in this rotation trying to get to the next job. He said there's a, lot of, there's a lot of marketers that are actually finding their way up. And again, this is this whole story about the haves and the have-nots, the visionary marketers versus the tacticianary marketers. And as I, I won't, it, Kurt has actually seen me do the entire book in 10 minutes. I won't do that now because my time's running out. But what I talk about in the book, um, and I made it really simple mostly for myself, is I wrote five chapters, um, five shifts, and this is kind of, 
as I talked to these visionary marketers, interviews and quantitative studies and my clients, they said these were the shifts that they have made or they are making today to actually transform their organizations and importantly transform their job and, their, in effect, their company. This first shift, and it kind of perfectly dovetails off of what Adam said, is get out of your marketing, your, your little marketing world, and stop thinking about your marketing plan, your marketing budget, your marketing strategy, and start thinking about your growth plan, your growth strategy, and your growth budget. And it's a very different mindset for most marketers. And I talk about different ways of how you can get a, how you can get a seat at that strategy table. And the number one way, bar none, to take anything, one thing away from this conversation is insights. And I would argue whether you're in marketing or not, if you don't have the research and the analytics and don't know your customers and your competitors better than anybody else in the organization, and you can't actually in, and call the insights, not just insights, insights that could lead to in-market impact, you're leaving a lot of opportunities on the table. And I would argue insights is what gets you to move from just doing marketing to doing growth. Second shift is all about this idea, and it's a big one for marketers to let go of. And I know when I was at P&G, we, we kind of held this really close to the vest and close to the heart is you don't own your brand. You've never owned your brand. At best, you could help to influence the network that influences the, the decision made about your brand. And we live in a, you just heard in this first presentation, I think we're going to hear it on all of our presentations. We live in this crazy networked world right now. And the ability for us to be in the madman era and kind of push our message in a closed way, in a one-way dialogue, it's gone. And so figuring out how to influence the influencers is the game now. Uh, third shift, shocking. So 75% of marketers we talked to um, had no involvement in innovation, which, is, which is, just blows my mind. These are marketers. And in theory, marketers should know, if they're doing their research and their insights and they're keeping on top of trends and like, they should know where the white space opportunities are best. And it, it goes to R&D, it goes to engineering, it goes to the people that own the brand, and marketing's just not at the table. And these visionary marketers all would tell you they are part, not just a part of the dialogue, they're driving the dialogue, and they're kind of getting everybody out of the box. The world curtain I used to live in where it's about new products and new services. No, it's about new business models. It's about new experiences. It's about new channel strategies. It's about new pricing. So that's this third shift. The fourth shift, and this, one is, this one's a hard one because it's been years for marketing to kind of figure out the science behind marketing and can I figure out the return on the sponsorship or the return on this ad campaign. This is saying, yeah, you got to do that, but you also have to figure out how to make trade-offs across all the demand drivers. Again, channel and pricing and offering and, and, and price and communications and the like. And uh, one of my friends, um, a woman named Chris Gibson, she's the CMO of United Healthcare, she said, the day I was able to selflessly trade off a PGA sponsorship for opening up a Western Region sales office was the day my executive team started to take me more seriously. And I think as marketers, we have to really think about, it's about demand. It's about demand leading to growth. And this last one is, um, is uh, I have a friend here that was at GE and she would recognize this comment, is that most companies continue to go to market the way they are organized. The way the org chart kind of represents the organization is how they all kind of march in. One of my clients, and I've been, I'm allowed to talk about GE Healthcare, they operate, they have 39 different P&Ls. Where's Antoinette? Where we are, 39, something like that, some ridiculous. And you go into a hospital and in, in a CEO of a hospital, and they could pull out 39 business cards because they had 39 different people visit them you know, over the last quarter. And that's not how the CEO of that hospital wants to operate. They want you to come with an integrated solution across all your offerings and bring a much bigger kind of answer to the, whatever the problem is. So these are the five shifts. I'm like a firm believer that marketing has such a big role to play in the growth of an organization. And importantly, as marketers, as a marketer, it's a big payoff for you. You're going to feel better about your job and like you're adding more value. Huge payoff for your company because they're going to tap into this asset they never even knew they had for many companies. And I think more importantly, or most importantly, big payoff for the customer because if the marketer is the closest to the customer, there's a good chance that the offering is going to be really what the customer wants. Thank you.